I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar on establishing a dry farm vineyard. My name is Lauren Pesch. I am a vineyard owner and manager and consultant in the Napa Valley. I'm also the project manager for a dry farming project that is being funded by the Department of Water Resources. So I'd like to give a little bit of background about the project. The California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance, um, in partnership with Community Alliance with Family Farmers, recently secured a three-year, $2 million contract with the Department of Water Resources to provide education on dry farming and water conservation in coastal wine grapes with funding allocated in the state budget. This project will create resources and tools for dry farming and water conservation education and outreach. We're developing case studies and cost benefit evaluations of dry farm vineyards, providing site specific technical assistance for determining, su determining suitability for dry farming and assist wine grape growers in converting or establishing a dry farm vineyard. So if you're interested in this technical assistance portion, um, please put your information in the chat and we'll reach out to you. Uh, this is completely free and we will come out to your vineyard as many times as you need. And we'll talk about dry farming. We'll also just talk about um, dry, dry farming tools to help um, reduce water usage. So I'd like to thank our four panelists, um, Riggs Loca from Emeritus, Jordan Lumberg from Tablas Creek, Todd Mastero from Dominus, and Rory Williams from Frog's Leap. Um, I'm going to ask a question to each of the panelists, and this will give them the opportunity to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their vineyard, how many acres they farm, the rootstock, variety, spacing. Afterwards, we'll answer questions from the audience that people have typed in the Q&A, and Chris Beal, our um, CAF representative, will moderate the Q&As. And then um, at the end, we will also put up a survey for our dry farming suitability index that we're building. So if you already dry farm, please fill out the survey and it's going to help us um, kind of build out this mapping system to see where people dry farm in California. And then last, this webinar is being recorded and we'll send out a link at the very end. So Riggs, uh, first question is for you. How do you prepare the soil before planting a dry farm vineyard? Manager for a dry farming project that's being funded by the Department of Water Resources. So I wanna give just a brief um, kind of background of what this project is. The California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance in partnership with the Community Alliance with Family Farmers recently secured a three-year, $2 million contract with the Department of Water Resources. Um, to provide education on dry farming and water conservation in coastal wine grapes with funding allocated in the state budget. So this project is going to create resources and tools for dry farming and water conservation education and outreach. We're developing case studies and cost benefit evaluations of dry farm vineyards and providing, we're also providing um, site specific technical assistance for determining suitability for dry farming and assist wine grape growers in converting or establishing a dry farm vineyard. So if you're interested in getting the technical assistance, please put your information in the chat. So it's completely free of charge and we would come out as many times as you need to talk about dry farming, to look at your vineyard, um, to even just talk about using dry farming techniques to lessen the amount of water that you're um, using. So please just let us know. Um, my email will also be at the end of the webinar, so you can always send me an email. And now I'd like to thank um, our four panelists for um, being here today. Riggs Loca from Emeritus, Jordan Lomberg from Tablas Creek, Todd Mastero from Dominus, and Rory Williams from Frog Sleep. Um, I'm going to ask a question to each of the panelists to get started. And they will take this opportunity to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about their vineyard, how many acres they farm, the rootstock variety, spacing. Um, afterwards, we will answer your questions. So please, um, you know, during the panelists, when the panelists are speaking, just put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll be sure to get to them at the end. Um, and then at the very end of the webinar, there's also gonna be a link to a survey so if you already dry farm, we'd appreciate you filling out the survey. It's gonna help us with a dry farming suitability index that we're building. 
So I'm going to start with Riggs. Um, Riggs, can you tell us how you prepare the soil before planting a dry farm vineyard? Absolutely. Uh, so good morning. Uh, my name is Riggs Locke. I'm the vineyard manager at Emeritus Vineyards uh, over here in Sebastopol, uh, Sonoma County. Uh, we have two estate vineyards, uh, one, the Halberg Ranch, which is 110 acres, and another 30-acre vineyard on the south end of Sebastopol that we call Pinot Hill. Um, some background on the vineyard itself, <clears throat> uh, it's 25 years old now. Uh, it was purchased in 1999. We just celebrated our 25th year. Uh, we are spaced meter by two meters, um, and so it's a much closer planting, uh, intense plant. Uh, on both branches. Uh, they're both dry farmed and uh, we're really excited to explain how we established uh, the specific vineyard itself. And so um, with that, we're just Pinot Noir growers. Uh, so, you know, the fancy grapes that are very delicate uh, and they need a lot of attention. Um, so we're very lucky with the soil types that we have. Uh, the reason we purchased the property is because the top layer of it is Gold Ridge soil which is very sandy and, and porous. Uh, and below that is the Sebastopol series clay, which is also a high sand content, which allows us to dry farm the vineyard uh, to the highest ability. Uh, we rely on just rainfall uh, during the winter. We normally get anywhere between 30 to 35 inches of rain every single year here at the ranch. And so uh, we've been very lucky the last couple of years, but the way that we prepared the land uh, previously, it was a apple ranch, and so we did need to uh, kind of tame down the nitrogen levels that we had uh, by utilizing cover crops, by opening up the soil, allowing our uh, rippers to get down to, you know, four and a half feet to break off that top layer of clay so we can open it up just a little bit more. Um, you know, so we did rip it, we disked it, we pulled all the roots as much as we possibly could. Um, made it a really easy job to do as it's a lot of sand. Um, but then to establish the vineyard, um, we did have to watch for nematodes. Nematodes don't normally attack apple trees nearly as bad as they do uh, vineyards uh, or vines. And so we uh, we did try and tame those down to the best of our ability. Uh, but allowing that to happen uh, when we establish the vineyard, uh, our main rootstock here on Halberg Ranch is 101.14. Uh, so a mild vigor, not a huge vigor, um, because we did recognize that we had a lot of nitrogen in the soil. Um, and then down at Pinot Hill on the south end of Sebastopol, our main rootstock is Swartzman. Uh, so uh, we understand the differences in the climate and areas that our vineyards are at. And so when we established the vineyard, we did put in an irrigation line using half a uh, gallon emitters uh, to get the vines going. Uh, and then we reduced the opportunity for the vines to uh, stretch down. And so as you can see in this picture, um, we've got the gold ridge soil, which is the great content up there on top. And once the roots finally hit that Sebastopol series clay, they did find a, a different aeration pockets uh, to get down and start going straight down. Uh, we conventionally till everything um, with the exception of 30 acres, which we do not till. Um, but in the beginning we did till probably every three weeks so that we could start forcing those vines to find uh, the water there in the Sebastopol series clay. Um, but that's how we got it kind of started and got it moving um, was just that establishment uh, of trying to open up the ground, allow the vines to find the water availability and push down into that Sebastopol series clay. Uh -huh. Great. Thanks Riggs. Appreciate that. Um, Okay, so now we're going to go to Rory Williams with Frog Sleep Winery. Um, Rory, what rootstocks have you found success with with dry farming? And what challenges have you encountered with certain rootstocks? Thanks, Lauren. Uh, thanks, everybody, for attending today. Um, so just brief background, uh, you're looking at a picture of St. George and uh, 03916 in front of you, uh, two rootstocks that we've worked with. We uh, either own or directly lease or farm about 180 acres here in Napa, uh, mainly in the St. Helena and Rutherford AVAs, um, and pretty wide variability in terms of rootstocks. We have St. George, 110R, um, 03916, as you see, a little Run 40 Ruggeri, a little bit of 5C, um, kind of bopping around depending on uh, the different conditions that the soils will need. 
Um, we've been dry farming since the uh, since the late 80s, early 90s uh, with the vineyards we have. Spacing's kind of all over the map, some 5 by 10, some 8 by 8, all the way up to 8 by 11. Um, so some, some big rows as well. Um, and have had success on all of those uh, soil types, everything from, um, you know, gravelly loams and the kind of classic benchland soils down to really, really deep river soils with extra amounts of silt and clay in there, all the way up to Maxwell clay, flat out adobe, hard, uh, hard pan clay. And we're still able to uh, uh, dry farm in all of those conditions. And the, the main kind of consideration that we've had with rootstocks, we've had success with all of them, although it's um, taken, you know, I think sometimes there's a, there's a, uh, an assumption that only certain rootstocks are are good for dry farming, St. George being the kind of classic dry farming rootstock, um, but it's not the only tool in our book. Um, we were we just started working with 03916 a few years ago, uh, having to deal with a nematode issue. And it becomes a question of trying to figure out the different quirks of every rootstock. St. George is easy. Um, 03916 is not easy, um, but you're able to uh, combine elements of uh, selection, really babying things along and really figuring out what I know we'll talk about in a different section, which is how to water them and how to kind of get them into a vigorous state. I think that's the the overall goal with the rootstock, uh, whatever we're, uh, whenever we're planting it out there is try to establish that deep roots system before we're asking it to grow any grapes. Um, we plant dormant rootstocks and then field bud um, for us, that we've seen the greatest success that way in terms of building a deep root uh, root structure, uh, letting it grow for an entire season on its own, and then allowing it to, uh, and then grafting on the variety that we're working with. And variations on that kind of theme, we've been able to find success even on hillside slopes, even on 10% slopes uh, with the right kind of uh, treatment that goes into it. Um, so yeah, I think it's it rootstock is is not the sexiest talk about topic to talk about with uh with vineyard management. We all love to talk about clones and and things like that, but it's the most I would think the most one of the most powerful tools you have in our book to really consider site. Um, what's you know what's the evolutionary history of the of the uh, of the grapes that, of the rootstock that you're trying to plant, um, and having it work. Uh, having using that evolution in your favor to establish the right kind of root system for the soils that you're in. Obviously, phylloxera com resistance comes first. Uh, we've all learned that lesson uh, a couple times. But um, after that, you get to really play with how deep does its taproot go? How vigorously does it spread? Um, you know, does it take a long time to develop? 03916 needs a planting carton and needs to be babied along, whereas St. George, you can basically stick in the ground and it'll roll. Um, and so that's a, it's been a learning process, but I would say we've had success with everything. And I know that, you know, just listening to Riggs talk about using 10114, which we don't use, um, but it's the kind of thing that, that, uh, that can be done when you've got uh, the right kind of process involved with it. And Rory, can you just touch on like how you, you know, allow the rootstock to grow the first year, right? You mm -hmm. let it kind of push out and yeah. Yeah, so our typical process is planting it in uh, the early spring, um, uh, planting the dormant rootstock, um, you know, being careful with how we plant it to prevent any kind of uh, little feeder roots on the surface. So trimming those off, uh, root preparation, making sure the root is viable uh, before you put it in the ground, which saves time. Um, and then making sure it's not gonna J root. So making sure those, uh, those roots are trimmed and heading straight down as opposed to kind of spread out. Um, and, you know, you want to be able to try and encourage that vine to go um, to send its roots deep immediately. Um, we then let it grow that entire season for something like St. George, which can grow vigorous, vigorously very early. Um, we're able to usually fall bud that uh, just after that one kind of growing season. For something like 03916, tends to kind of look dead for a couple of months and you makes a vineyard manager a little nervous. Um, and then it starts to bush out. And although we're usually spring grafting it the year following, it ends up being just as vigorous. And so it's a matter of patience. It's a matter of trying to understand how this root wants to grow. 
in the soil that it's in and using that to your advantage. Thanks, Rory. So now we're going to move to Jordan. Um, so Jordan, during the first couple years of a dry farm vineyard, it's typical to water the vines. So how do you go about watering your vines at Tablas Creek? Yeah, thanks for uh, joining us, everyone. My name's Jordan Lomborg. Um, we're located down in Paso Robles, uh, California. Uh, Talbus Creek is about 20 minutes west of Paso Robles proper. Uh, we're 10 miles from the ocean as a crow flies, average around 25 inches uh, of rain a year. And we're planted on um, a calcareous formation, a lot of limestone, a lot of clay in our soil. So really, really good water holding capacity and uh, makes it very conducive for dry farming. Um, we've tried all sorts of methods as far as irrigating a, a grapevine is concerned when you're when you're dry farming. Um, it is necessary for the first couple of years to to keep water on these root systems and keep them going, especially, you know, if you're in an area like we are where we average 25 inches of rain a year, but there are definitely years where we've only seen 10 or 11. So you need to be uh, prepared for situations like that. Um, we have tried uh, on smaller plantings and it's been successful using five gallon buckets with a five sixteenth inch hole drilled in the bottom of that bucket, about an inch off the bottom. Um, and if you can manage it and it's a small, small planting, small acreage, it can be really effective. Um, then we have moved into more of an automated system recently. This, the pictures you're looking at here is a 35 acre dry farm planting. Um, and it's on pretty steep hillsides. We, we tried the, the bucket method one year and that was, a. a a pretty miserable failure. Um, the amount of effort and labor that went into that system was was just too much. Uh, and this planting is also offset from our vineyard. We don't have any underground irrigation set up. We have some water tanks on top of this hill uh, that we put a pump on and and fill these these lines. Um, so we had to get creative is basically what I'm saying. Uh, so I, I teamed up with our local irrigation supply company and we, we took a system out of row crop farming. Um, so what you see here is that, that white hose is a, a, a lay flat Netafim product. You can dictate the spacing. For us, we plant uh, on a 12 by 12 typically. Uh, in a diamond pattern, which allows us to cross cultivate. Um, and this system replaces a whole bunch of hands. It allows for just one person to go up there and, and turn the water on. Um, we dictated our, our, our drip line spacing to 12 feet. So from that two inch lay flat hose, you'll see our half inch irrigation lines going to each of the plants uh, on a half gallon emitter. Um, and on the, on the run or the, the, the fall or the downward slope of these two inch lines, there's a bunch of pressure reducers because you can imagine there's quite a bit of head pressure in that water, um, on a 10 or 15 degree slope. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it saved us in a lot of ways. Um, we irrigate our irrigation decisions are largely based on the amount of rain we receive in the previous winter. Once we plant, we typically like to go with a, a dormant bench graft uh, in our system. And once we plant and, you know, if, if we get a lot of rain, we're typically not disking until uh, late April, early May. We know at that point we're going to have a lot of water in the ground. So if we can we can get that soil turned um, as soon as we feel like the rain has stopped, then our irrigation decision is 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 we're able to push 
push that back a little bit. We want those roots to kind of follow that water into the soil profile. Um, if we don't get a lot of rain, it's a whole different scenario. We're typically turning that soil uh, in, in March and then we're irrigating on a weekly basis. Um, not a lot. We don't need to irrigate a lot. That that those root systems are pretty small. The vines will get probably I don't know two three gallons every couple of weeks. Uh, a lot of it's visual to a certain extent, um, but you know always 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 pray for rain. We've gotten really lucky these last couple of winters, and it it really shows in the the parts of the vineyard that have been established and parts of the vineyard that we just planted. So that's pretty much our system. I think, you know, everybody, every property is going to be unique. If you have irrigation set up, you're in a, in a good spot. You will need water for those first two years, hopefully. Uh, and you can cut it off after those two years. Um, if you aren't, you know, as lucky as some people and you don't have an irrigation system set up, you don't have a well nearby, there are there are avenues of being able to get creative and using tanks and using pumps and using some of this lay flat hosing to uh, get vineyards going, dry farm vineyards going. Thanks, Jordan. Um, and in my, in my experience, I've had some clients that have had drip systems already put in and then we just you know, use that. We dig a, um, I'll dig a basin around each vine and let the water go. So we get a few gallons in there and then cover it up. So there's all different ways to, to water those vines in the first couple of years. So Todd, um, what are some of the typical vineyard practices during the first two years of a dry farm vineyard? And what implements would you recommend for people? Yeah, good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I dry farm and make wine at uh, Dominus Estate. We're just over 100 acres, and we've always been dry farmed since the vineyard was first planted in 1838. So it's been dry farmed for 186 years. We're located on the bench lands. Um, in fact, just behind me, you've got the Mayacamas, and we're planted on an alluvial fan with clay loam soils, and those soils are fed by underground springs, um, which flow throughout the summer. So we're in a good position to, to dry farm. We get about a 31 and a half uh, inches of rainfall per year. And our spacing is nine feet between the rows and four feet between our vines. Um, we're planted mainly to Cabernet Sauvignon, about 90% Cabernet Sauvignon. We have 5% Pretty Verdot and 5% Cabernet Franc. Um, in terms of rootstocks, we use 10114 primarily, but we also use 3309 and a bit of Rupestri, St. George, and 110R. We even have a little bit of riparia. Um, we're not crazy about the quality, but it, it does grow and it's even quite vigorous, and especially in rainy years. So I wanted to focus on um, how to establish really deep root growth uh, in the first couple of years. And some of the key uh, things, some that have already been mentioned, uh, but a couple of things that maybe haven't been mentioned or focused on as much um, to really promote deep root growth in those first uh, two to three years. So number one, pretty obvious, but we plant as early in the spring as possible, even late winter. And if we could, we'd plant in February, but uh, March is great. If we can't get in uh, in March because of the wet soils, we'll plant in April, May, but the the earlier the better because you take advantage of the so of the water already present in the soil. It also just gives the the plants a longer growing period during the first season, so it's pretty important for us. We all also consider it pretty important to plant rooted rootstocks instead of bench grafts, and that allows us to promote a lot of vigorous vegetative growth in the first year, and we feel like that. Uh, growth that you see above ground is going to be mirrored by growth of roots underground. Um, so that's that's an important piece for us. Um, also, the preparation of our rootstocks, we consider uh, really critical. So typically the rootstocks are delivered and the roots are, you know, there's this mop of roots, sometimes 10, 12 inches long. 
And we cut those roots pretty short. So we just use some trimmers and we cut those to about an inch to an inch and a half. It's a little scary. It can feel a little bit, um, a little violent, but we find that that's one of the best ways to prevent J rooting is if those roots are really short. We I've done that for 25 years and I've never had an issue with those getting established. So we do it pretty systematically. Um, the second thing, which is really critical, and we've made the mistake of not doing it sometimes, that is once you've got those roots, uh, rootstocks trimmed, we like to soak them for at least 24 hours. So we basically submerge them in water to hydrate them. So when they're planted, they don't dehydrate. And especially if it's going to be hot or you get a high heat wave after you're planting, those, um, those rootstocks can uh, dehydrate. And so by soaking them, that has proved to be a really great, uh, a great method. In terms of planting, um, we start by digging a hole with a shovel. And then we use, let me see if I can show you this tool. This is just a, a duck build uh, shovel. And we dig a hole about 12 inches deep with this guy. So it's a pretty narrow hole, but since we've already started with a shovel, we've got a bit of a basin. Um, so we've got, a, and that will help us when we irrigate that first time. So we'll uh, dig the basin, we'll dig the deeper hole, about 10 inches deep, we'll place the rootstock, we add a little bit of soil, and then we pull up on the vine and we tap down with the end of the shovel just to make sure that there are no air pockets. We consider that really important, especially around the root system. Then we repeat at adding earth and tapping down lightly on the earth until we reach the top. And then we reach the top and we still have a bit of a basin and we usually water with a water hose and a tank that first irrigation. That's about four, four gallons. Um, it's not only to provide water to the vine, but it's to flush out any air pockets in that hole. Um, if you're early enough in the season, your vines are gonna have plenty of water. And then during the season, that so that first year, we'll probably irrigate two to three times depending on the soil types. And um, we install a drip irrigation and we leave that drip irrigation for the first three years because we feel like the drip irrigation allows us to get deep irrigations. Um, we'll use about 10 gallons for each irrigation. And the way that we determine the moment of irrigation is by digging a hole and it, it, evaluating the depth of the roots and just the moisture levels of the soil. And when you start to have uh, those moisture levels dissipate, um, we we will irrigate. So I'd say a shovel is your most valuable implement in determining your irrigations. That's the most valuable tool that we have here on the ranch. Um, in year N plus one, so the year after we've planted, we'll graft in May. And um, in order to prepare for the grafting, we'll dig a basin around the hole. So about eight to 10 inches uh, at the base of the, the rootstock and we'll cut any superficial roots. So once again, we'll use these guys just to cut the roots at the base of the rootstock to avoid any horizontal growth. And we'll irrigate only when necessary. Once again, by digging a hole, evaluating the root depth and seeing if there's soil moisture. And if there is, we don't irrigate if it's starting to dry out, we do. Usually that's two to three times in the second year. And then by the third year, we dig once again around the base of the rootstock, we trim superficial roots, and then we'll irrigate only when necessary. After about three years, we no longer need to irrigate because the roots are deep enough and they're accessing water on their own. Thanks, Todd. Okay, I'm going to pass it on now to Chris Beal, who's our CAF representative, and she is going to um, um, field some of the questions and um, have the panelists answer. Great. Thanks, Lauren, and uh, great uh, 
information by all of our panelists. Uh, of course, we have a question about yield. So I know everybody's on different spacings and things like that, but if you could say a few words about your yield. Yeah, I, I'll field this uh, just to start. Um, I love this question because it's it's one of the first questions I get right after rootstocks. Um, we generally have to crop thin to reach the yields that we want because we can easily be at six, seven, eight tons per acre um, on established vines. And that's when I say established, after about five, six years, we can easily be... Um, we have the capacity to produce a lot more than we want. We'll usually crop thin to be between three and a half to four and a half um, tons per acre. I could echo that at least for the for where we're at in St. Helena and Rutherford. I mean, it, it greatly depends upon variety, but for Bordeaux reds, um, I would agree with Todd. We we thin every year, um, even in 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 relatively dry years, to achieve that kind of three and a half to, you know, four and a quarter tons per acre, depending upon the, the block itself. That's for Cab and, and Merlot uh, and Cab Franc. For something like Zinfandel, you're easily in that four to four and a half ton per acre range. Whites uh, like Sauvignon Blanc, even higher than that. Um, so I, I think there's maybe, you know, it, this may differ if you're, you know, planting in five, five inches of soil on a rocky hillside. Um, it's probably a different kind of thing, but in our kind of typical soils, I, I feel like not irrigating maybe limits our maximum theoretical yield. Um, maybe we could get 10 tons per acre if we irrigated, uh, but we get exactly what we want without having to irrigate. Yeah, in, in Paso, so we're, you know, as I mentioned, <clears throat> we're on a, on a 12 by 12 spacing. Um, it's obviously varietal dependent, uh, you know, in our Grenaches, we're typically seeing anywhere from one to three tons per acre. Uh, and then to not will be well above that. Um, so it's it's largely varietal dependent, but I'd say across the board, we're in that two to three ton per acre range and, and very little thinning. Um, we really focus on how many spur positions are per vine and, and kind of have an idea of what that variety is going to give us. I think for me at Emeritus, uh, we're only a Pinot Noir house, um, but we have to crop thin every year. doesn't matter if it's a drought year or if it's a super heavy rainfall year. Uh, we manage it so that it's three to three and a half tons to the acre. Um, I've got a really vigorous spot on our dry farms, uh, our you know, right here close to the winery itself that I could probably get close to, you know, 10 to 12 tons an acre uh, just because of the clone that it is. Uh, but we thin every single year. We're averaging three to three and a half tons uh, by the time we get through harvest. Great. Thank you. And I had a question for Rory. Um, uh, I may have missed it, but what month do you try to plant your dormant rootstock and how many waterings before fall budding? Uh, so we typically plant in April, um, basically once we can get in there and we've started to uh, mow down cover crop, um, started to do a little, the first couple pass, uh, first pass of disking, um, get in there with a French hoe plow, which is how we manage in, but in undervine, uh, co uh, cover. Um, but typically in that point, while there's still like to echo what Todd said, while there's still moisture in the ground, um, if you're planting a, a rootstock in dry ground, um, you know, which in a, in a, you know, in an extremely dry year, maybe you can't avoid that. Um, just because of your workflow with pruning and tying and stuff like that, there's lots of other, uh, considerations there, but we're in that April kind of timeline. Typically we're watering by hand. We dig a little basin around the vines and hand water with a water trailer, uh, that's got a little low flow, uh, uh, low pressure pump on it um, to add that kind of five gallons, usually twice a year in its first year. Um, so the 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 lone root stock will get two waterings of about four to five gallons a piece. The following year, so after grafting or uh, kind of second leaf, you might say, will typically water once, and then after that it's cut off. Um, that 
will do, you know, will vary from time to time. We'll examine a vine. If it's not growing very well, maybe we'll add a watering in there. Um, that's for us a visual assessment of the vine vigor uh, up top. Um, you know, something like O3916 in a very, very dry year may need three waterings during that first summer. But after that, it is typically follows that same one watering in the second year path. It's it's sort of like you're trying to get that root established. And once it establishes, once you get those roots going deep, it's going to take off. Um, and once it takes off, you're you're looking to to cut off that water fairly quickly so that you can continue to develop those roots even deeper. Does anyone want to add to that? Okay. And also, when you say when you get those roots established and go deep, how deep? Like, are what kind of numbers are we talking about before you think about kind of cutting off the water? Anyone? For us, we're not measuring root depth in that way. Um, again, a, it's more of a visual assessment of vine vigor up top um, and using that as a... a an interpretive tool, basically. Yeah, I'd have to agree with Rory. I think at this point we have a pretty good understanding of of uh, what it what a vine looks like when it's kind of on its own, um, and especially you know if it's a it's that previous winter's rainfall was um, substantial, and we are able to get the discs in. You know, I think we have a pretty good understanding that those roots are, are going to be on their own at that point. I think for us, uh, you know, looking at what our topsoil level is, uh, depending on how much air is getting down to where the root system is, uh, you know, we have a variation on the Gold Ridge soil that goes from two feet deep to 10 feet deep. So depending on where it's at in the branch, that's kind of where we, we make the cutoff in terms of how long or where they need to be, but it is a visual assessment of what the vines think they need. Great, and I have a couple of questions about keeping the, you know, kind of the establishment irrigation system in place just in case. And I know there's sort of a mixture of experiences here, whether you are potentially irrigating in times of drought. Do some of you want to talk about that? I'll take that first question. Uh, I gave a tour yesterday to a, group of people from Mexico and they asked, why do you have irrigation lines still in the vineyard if if you're not irrigating? Um, my biggest thing is, is it's a, a time and a trash deposit. Uh, if we needed to pull all the, uh, the irrigation lines, then we would do it. Um, it's just one of those things that it costs us more money to pull it out after we've utilized it for the, the primary first two, three years. Um, and so it's still sitting out there in the vineyard. Um, we maintain it. Uh, the predators that are around, so the coyotes, the skunks, foxes, you name it, uh, they love to chew on the darn things um, and make a mess in the vineyard. And so we clean it up at that point in time. We don't normally replace it. So um, we do leave it alone. Um, it's not really an eyesore because the idea is, is that we're looking at the vines from uh, above or into that canopy uh, to watch the the overall vigor and the, the health of the vines themselves. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't take away from the, the beauty of the vineyard being dry farmed. Yeah, I'll, I'll I agree with Riggs. There's a calculation of, uh, so we install our uh, drip line in that first year, and it's very useful to uh, for the first, second, third year. And after that, you have to calculate whether it's worth the time and labor to pull that out. What we've discovered is that after about three years, We'll pull it out and reuse it for the following planting, if we have one, um, in areas that are a little bit more stressed or for whatever reason, oftentimes in heavy clay soils where the soils aren't that deep and we hit a hard pan at five or six feet, those soils we might need to irrigate an additional year. So we'll keep that uh, irrigation line in for a little bit longer. But generally over time, after about six, seven years, we'll pull out those lines. On our end, we're not installing an irrigation line um, for uh, for the purposes of establishing. So we're just hand watering with a with a water trailer. Um, part of that is that some of our vineyards simply don't have the infrastructure available to to provide that water. Um, and to begin with, we don't have a pond, don't have a proper 
have a well that's enough for um for spraying but that's about it um part of it probably has to do with the fact that i suck at installing irrigation and so maybe that uh that goes into your calculus but um you know we've taken on vineyards that had previously installed irrigation and we do maintain those um but we essentially don't use them i guess it's it makes you feel good at night to have a comfort blanket with uh just in case you need to irrigate but we've never had to use them in that respect due to the the nature of our um planting pattern you know we're really wide we we cross cultivate the entire property um we do have to pull up our irrigation every year. We roll everything up and it, it's a pretty mobile system. Uh, takes about four guys and a couple drip line wheels and we're able to um, do it efficiently for the most part. But uh, yeah, it's it's set up and, and, and removed uh, each year, but you know, it's, it's a two year process. So uh, again, we can move that out and um, and and reuse it uh and regarding the the drought situation i mean the beauty of dry farming and depending on your your soil types uh if there's any plant on the property that can handle a drought it's our dry farm vines typically our irrigated trellis portions of the property are the parts that struggle during drought or heat events even um, our 12 by 12 plantings, the last drought that we went through, I believe in 21, 22, the yields in our dry farm plantings were not affected at all. Um, our trellised irrigated portions of the vineyard were probably down by half when we are in that 22, uh, the, the, the second year of that, that, that drought. So I think that's, that's one of the beauties of dry farming. And if you understand your soil and you have the right root stock, um, you're much less affected by these extreme weather events. I agree with you, Jordan. I've When we've had some extreme heat events here, our dry farm vineyards have been able to go through those events, you know, pretty well. And I have to think that with such an expansive root system, right? That they're able just to access so much more of the, any soil moisture, right? Deep down. So I've had personal experience with that as well. Yeah. I mean, leaf burn, uh, sunburn, all of it, even just this, this summer, uh, you know, we were hitting 114 degrees down here in Paso for a couple of days. And it, it really, it's a fascinating thing to walk out into a dry farm vineyard. And there's fruit exposed um and just very little damage comparatively to what we are seeing in in our trellis portions of the vineyard it's hard to wrap your head around i'm wondering if you all could talk a little bit about your decision on spacing uh you're all farming in different conditions different soils i mean how do you make that final decision I'd be curious about the thinking behind that. Well, I'll walk you through um, the evolution of our, our spacing, which might help uh, this discussion. We uh, In the early 80s, the entire vine, uh, vineyard was planted 12 by 10 and all head pruned. Over time, we started to, to trellis um, and we started planting a little more dense and we've landed today at nine by four so nine feet between our rows and four feet between our our vines um we have another ranch that we dry farm in oakville so just a mile away and that's planted at eight by four and there's a pretty stark uh difference between vigor in those two uh ranches the eight by four is just on the edge, uh, it's balanced. We we feel it's balanced, and the quality is pretty incredible. But I I think we all agree that we wouldn't want less vigor than what we have there. So for our soils, eight by four tends to be a good what we think is a good balance. We've tried eight by four here at the um, in the Yonville property, and uh, we, it's those vines are still young, so the the Jury's still out on how those will do over time. Um, doing okay so far. 
And uh, but we, we think any more dense, we might start having competition that might be a little bit too excessive between vines. You know, uh, we're in Paso Robles, so we average 25 inches of rain a year, but there are plenty of years we get much less than that. There are years that we get more. Um, we find that the 12 by 12 pattern here is a, a spacing that um, some of the older dry farmers in the area, uh, you know, we have a couple 80 year old deducies are planting on a much wider spacing. Um handful of others and you know so much of dry farming is is looking towards the past and and um seeing how those farmers did it so uh 12 by 12 for us we feel like is a really safe place to be we can get the yields that we want without having to drop too much fruit and um we're not as worried about competition it also allows us to move the tractor through the vineyard when we're spraying um and there's also a lot less movement of insects. Leafhopper is a is a uh, one of our major pests. So creating a little bit of space in between the vines we find to be pretty helpful. I think for me, uh, you know, I I have the smallest spacing, I guess, out of everybody here. So meter by two meters. Uh, when we purchased the property, the idea was we wanted to maximize the space and maximize the amount of uh, fruit that we could produce. Uh, and being Pinot Noir, it does have a tendency not to be a overly large producer. Um, and so when we made it meter by two meters, the idea was that we wanted to maximize the space. Uh, and our tractor drivers were told that if they took out a vine, they had to buy it themselves. Um, but the idea was, was to maximize the space. Um, and we haven't recognized that any of the vines uh, have been, you know, in terms of competition for water, depending on what our soil type is and what we've got available to us, um, with the amount of sand that we have in the soil here, it allows those roots to go very, very deep. We expect them to be anywhere between 20 and 25 feet deep. Uh, so you, you probably won't touch uh, the amount of water that that soil actually contains uh, with what those vines might need. Riggs, how much rain, what's your annual rainfall? Uh, anywhere between 30 and 35 inches. Uh, this last year, new, we got double. And the year before, we got um, something close to like 63, 64. Um, so, uh, but in 21, that was the year that everybody was a drought. And so we had a total of 13 inches of rain and the vines didn't show any signs of needing water. Yeah, just for to follow up on the spacing thing, we've got, like I mentioned, we've got stuff eight by eight. Uh, there's kind of an old, an old saw in Napa about needing 50 square eight feet for, for a vine, but obviously Todd's an example against that. And we have five by 10 vineyards, uh, a vineyard at five by 10 that is right at that 50 square feet. And you think, oh, well, that's got to be the least vigorous. And that's probably the opposite of the case. Um, and so it's, uh, I think that there's maybe for a particular region or a particular soil type or uh, uh, annual rainfall, there's maybe a lower limit that you don't want to go much below. And there's probably an upper limit past which you get diminishing returns in terms of uh, space available to the vines. But I think that it's, you know, a lot of the reason we keep to this nine and a half foot spacing, nine, nine and a half foot spacing in most of our vineyards is that I would love to prevent the proliferation of tractor implements and tractor widths uh, uh, and have uh, keep my other decisions around the vineyard fair a little bit simpler. Lauren, do you have anything to add to that? about the spacing. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I, similar to Rory, right? Um, we think 50 square feet is what works well for us. So that's, in our ranch, we have all different um, spacings, but I think about 50 seems to be good. Great. And we I wanted to touch, somebody asked yeah. about the organic farming. And I, I wanted to say that I think with dry farming practices, it's really easy to be an organic farmer, right? Because I, I I listen to what vineyard managers talk about with the struggle of organics and it's weed control, right? And if you are a dry yeah. farmer, you are out there working the soil and you're not putting drip, you know, all year round or all summer round, right? Summer. 
So you just don't have that weed regrowth. And so I find it very easy to be organic and to dry farm. And so we, we are organic. I know Rory is, um, anybody else? Yeah, we're also organic. We farm yeah. some of it organically. Totally certified since 2003. Um, I think we find, we find too that with the way we set up our vines, um, there's a lot less need for these constant fungicide passes. I know Paso is, is unique. I mean, we're very dry down here. We get a lot of wind, uh, in the evening from, uh, the Marine influence, but I feel like disease pressure is a lot less down here. So there's very, we don't fertilize. Um, we'll probably make two or three fungicide passes a year and then just keep an eye on our canopy and our growth up there. And if we can manipulate that and allow some dappled light to get in there and uh, get that wind blowing through, we, we, we don't need much chemical at all. Yeah, I, I do feel like organics and dry farming are pretty synergistic just from a, um, are com very compatible for sure, because a lot of the practices we're doing for soil, you know, really farming the soil, which is a, a key tenet with organics, is it works, it's the same kind of thing you would do for dry farming, where a little light dusting of compost, that kind of two to three ton per acre dusting of compost that we add um, as kind of at the end of harvest, um, helps build soil structure, helps build that kind of um, water holding capacity in the soil, as well as being a, 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 a very moderate kind of nutrient add. Cover crops, cover crops, cover crops, just um, building soil health, building, um, you know, a healthy soil that's going to be able to provide nutrients to the vines is the same kind of soil that's going to be able to hold hold the winter rain and give it back to the vines uh, once it's uh, once you terminate that cover crop in the in the spring um, to you know way too much to talk about with organics in terms of spraying and and all the other challenges with that but in terms of soil management they are right on target with one another i know a very few i to be honest only one dry farmer in my sphere that is conventional um i think the the philosophy and the mindset is very organic to begin with um so it's very very possible to do uh could you each tell us a little bit more about your trellising and canopy management right. also no, oh, beach it. Um, so uh, we're VSP. Um, we do cordon pruning bilateral on uh, about 30 acres here at the Halter Ranch and then uh, another two acres down at Peanut Hill. Um, but our main pruning system is a two spur, one cane Guyot um, every single year. So that's how we manage the bigger. Um, but we're, we're VSP. Uh, it's uh, super simple for us to just go through that way not head pruned, just the idea of a single cane and two spurs, depending on the area and the amount of vigor that we get. We've got a double double cane system. So we've got two distinct um, curtains of vegetation. So two canes on one side with about four buds on each cane. And those shoots we train up um, into a Y pattern. So they come up fairly narrow and then they uh, um, they, they create these, these wings, if you will, uh, that allow us to shade both from above and then provide shade on the ground. And we really try to maximize that shade. Um, so it's a, it's a sort of liar shape and, um, yeah, we've been developing it for quite a long time. We keep evolving and and finding the best ways to maximize shade on the clusters and on the ground. And it's primarily primarily to adapt to those hot, uh, dry periods after verasion when the grapes are particularly fragile. We uh, have uh, all sorts of different training types. We've got things like Zin and Petit Syrah and Charbono even that uh, at a 10 by 10 head trained, uh, just, uh, you know, Gobla style. 
um, all the way up to all of our Cabernets on a split canopy, 18, two uh, parallel wires split 18 inches that build up into a 42 inch V trellis um, head trained with four potential canes. And we'll choose the number of canes depending on vine vigor and being able to adapt that to different uh, areas. And again, like to echo Todd, the main concern there is shading and building shading on top of the vines. That's one of the, the primary battles for us is keeping that uh, the appropriate amount of shade and light and uh, on on the grapes for flavor development, reducing disease pressure, but also dealing with the, the days at 110 degrees. We're, we're primarily, we no trellis on a 12 by 12. Everybody is uh, freestanding out there. And uh, we really like a, a vertical cordon. So if you could imagine like a, a spiral staircase, that that's the ideal spur positioning for us. Um, but you know, the, the length of the T post that vine will be planted on will be largely based on the varietal. So we like to keep our Grenache, uh, kind of short and squat. And when we're planting Syrah, say that's, that's a much longer T post. They're probably about six feet tall to kind of match up the bigger. Great. And is anyone here using soil moisture sensors? I have soil moisture probes um, at both sites. Um, I just use them as an idea of what I can show that we're not irrigating. Um, they go seven feet deep. And so with that, um, you know, I've got a block that's directly out back behind the winery here that uh, at seven feet says it only has 10% water and the vines are still growing. We just did our second hedging um and so we've got another six inch worth of growth tips on those specific vines so uh the soil moisture probes were there uh as a a complement to know exactly what the soil moisture was uh but i only utilize them just to to know how much water might still be in the soil great we we don't have a soil moisture probes we've used them on an experimental basis um <clears throat> just to examine some things, but I've never used them as a decision making tool uh, for what we're what we're doing. I don't know that if if all's going well, I don't know that soil moisture at 18 inches is giving us uh, actionable information, I, I guess. And so it becomes a question of cost at that point. Yeah, j just to add to that, instead of soil moisture probes, in order to evaluate the amount of water that our vines are accessing, we use uh, pressure bombs to to evaluate hydric potential um, pre-dawn generally, and that gives us an, a good idea of of how much water those those vines have access to. Um, I will say that that kind of information really has to be used um, uh, as you understand a vineyard and that way it reacts. Because every rootstock, every vineyard is going to have its own uh, criteria for for what is what looks like stress and what what doesn't. It's not um, those. There's no index that can be that's translatable across our vineyards. At least that's what it it seems to us. Great. We do have a few more questions and items that have come up in both the chat and the Q&A. So I would uh, ask our panelists uh, on the webinar to maybe go in and provide a little answer, a little discussion for people. But with that, I will hand it over to Lauren. Thanks, Chris. Yes, I know there's a lot of questions. I know we didn't get to answer every one, but I've taken, um, I've written them all down. I have them all saved and so if we don't get back to you now, I I or one of the panelists will personally send you an email with a follow-up. And if you have any other questions, my email address is here and please ask. Um, we, the part of this study, we do have um, funds to put in soil moisture probes and ET sensors. So we are doing that for um, a bunch of our dry farm vineyards. So we'll have kind of that information to share with everybody later on. And Jody did put the um, the the survey 
for the um, dry farming suitability index that we're working on. So if you dry farm, please um, take a moment and fill that out. And um, like I said, I'll try to get back to everybody and answer those questions. And thank you um, to Jordan and Todd and Rory and Riggs. Really, really appreciate um, you guys being out here today and happy harvest for everybody. I know we're all gonna start, start picking soon. So thank you all and um, we will be following up with everybody.